Welcome to our Talk About It Cancer Mental Health webinar series. My name is Lisa Perrott, and I'm the U.S. Lead for Patient Advocacy here at Beijing. And it is my honor to host our fourth Talk About It series on Cancer Mental Health webinar. This one, support for our cancer caregivers, the MVPs of the cancer treatment team, is in honor of National Family Caregiver Month, and we honor all of our caregivers. Talk About It is a unique Beijing program that elevates the important intersection. I encourage you to visit our website, cancermentalhealth.com, and learn more about what our, our exciting opportunities and activities and information that help people address mental health issues throughout our cancer experience. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. This webinar is being recorded for the Talk About It website. Everyone will be muted throughout the call, so please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask questions for the speakers. They'll be addressed during our Q&A at the end of the session. We will do our very best to get to as many questions as we can. Please note that this program is intended for awareness purposes only. It is not promotional and does not reflect the views or opinions of Beijing. Our objectives today are to learn more about the extent of distress as well as the positive benefits for cancer caregivers across the continuum of cancer care, to discuss the challenges and opportunities in getting help and support as a caregiver, and finally, to elevate the importance of integrating caregiver mental health into the quality cancer care, including advocacy and advocacy for policies that better support caregivers. It is now my privilege to introduce you to our special guest today. Dr. Allison Applebaum is the clinical psychologist and researcher at Memorial Sloan Candy Kettering Cancer Center. She is the founding director of the Caregivers Clinic at Memorial Sloan Kettering and the author of a new book due out in early 2024, Stand By Me, A Guide to Navigating Modern, Meaningful Caregiving. Joining us also is Lisa Ferguson, who is a mom, a wife, and a family caregiver for her husband, Nathan, who has chronic lymphocytic leukemia, also known as CLL. Lisa is here to share her experiences around maintaining mental health while caregiving for a loved one with cancer. Thank you, Allison and Lisa, for joining us today. Thank you so I'd much. I'd like to start with Lisa and ask you first, if you just share just a few words and a brief overview of your story. Sure. Thank you, Lisa. I'm happy to be here. So my husband was diagnosed in 2016 with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, like you mentioned, um, and it was probably one of the biggest shocks um, that we had ever had as a family. Um, it was completely unexpected. Uh, his his symptoms didn't present in a traditional type of type of way. So um, we thought he was having like some allergy issues, and he ends up going to the doctor and. Um, his blood cell count was really high. Uh, we had just moved our family 900 miles for a new job for me. Um, so we were in a situation where we didn't really have a support system. We didn't have family around. And we kind of, we just had to navigate the shock of being diagnosed with cancer. And at such a young age, he was 44 um, and our kids were 10 and five. And it was just, so really unexpected. And, and I think um, if there's one thing I've learned over the years is it felt so, um, I felt so alone and I, I don't want other people to feel alone. And so participating in things like this is really important to me because there's so many ways to get help um, and to make sure that you're okay so you can be there for your family. Um, so I just, I really appreciate being invited to speak today um, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you, Lisa. We're thrilled to have you. And, and we know we will learn a lot from your story um, and what you have to share that you've learned in your caregiving experience as well. Allison, would you like to say a few words and then we'll get us started? Sure. Well, first of all, I'm wishing everyone a happy National Family Caregivers Month. It's a great time to have this event and for us all to take care of ourselves and to think about the ways in which we can do a better job in achieving that. You know, and listening to what Lisa was sharing in terms of the shock, the unexpected nature and how isolating the experience was, this is incredibly common. I don't know if I should go into talking about the experience, but I think Lisa's description is absolutely perfect right there. You know, so my work focuses on addressing the mental health needs of family caregivers, and it is really challenging to be a family caregiver. 
It is physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, and existentially challenging. This is a very, very difficult role that in most cases we don't choose, right? It was unexpected for Lisa and her family. This was not something that you chose. And the fact that we don't have a choice in taking on the caregiving role very much shapes the experience of caregiving. Um, if we think about what we, we know from the research, it's, it's not gonna be surprising to anyone who's joining in today. We know that the mental health challenges of family caregivers are significant. And in many cases, they're greater than the challenges that are faced by the patients for whom you're providing care. So some statistics, we know that up to 50% of caregivers experience an anxiety disorder, up to 42% major depression. We don't have a prevalence estimate on PTSD or traumatic stress symptoms, but they're really common. In fact, rising post-pandemic, the, tra you know, the trauma of the pandemic and being a caregiver in the pandemic was, was quite significant. It's traumatic to be a caregiver. It's traumatic to ride in an ambulance and not know if your loved one's gonna be alive by the time you get to the hospital. It's traumatic to witness symptoms like delirium or a seizure. Um, and I'll say it's, it's traumatic to witness death if that's the outcome, even if death is occurring in a manner that is in accord with a patient's wishes. And these are very important, the traumas that, that we as caregivers carry. There are other symptoms that are that are really impairing, like insomnia. 75% of caregivers experience sleep difficulties and sometimes very severe insomnia, which then can prevent them from taking care of their loved ones. And I think most importantly, when this distress is left unaddressed, it increases exponentially. So it's really, really important that you get help. I wanna point one more thing out. Not only does it get worse if we don't get support, and understandably, if if you are in a situation where your loved one's cancer is not curable and, and you are moving towards um, palliative care and supportive care, of course, that's an incredibly distressing time. But I think that Lisa and others are in an interesting moment of survivorship. And I wanna talk about this for a minute because I think that survivorship is a period that we assume that everything's going well. In fact, many patients will say, patients with cancer will say, you know, I have a new lease on life. I've returned to a new normal we see a decrease in distress in patients, but we paradoxically see the opposite in caregivers. We actually see a very significant spike in distress in caregivers and survivorship. And this is likely because perhaps you, Lisa, during those initial period of, of his diagnosis and treatment, you were in fight or flight mode. You were going for first, second, and fifth opinions, maybe. You were doing everything you could to take care of him. You weren't gonna take an exhale, but the moment you can take an exhale, when we take that exhale, all the negative emotions that we likely are avoiding come rushing in. And so we actually see a very significant spike in distress in caregivers and survivorship. And I wanna point that out because I think that that's a real opportunity for anyone who's, who's thinking about getting care to get care. That's a really important time for support. I find myself like nodding my head to everything you're saying. It's, it's just, it, it's so much of it resonates um, with me. You know, Lisa, I'm curious, when I, we were listening, I was listening to Allison, and she mentioned um, the spike for caregivers and how it's almost the, the converse for what it is for patients, the spike in the depression, the anxiety. It, did you, have you experienced that, or do you know other caregivers that have experienced that as well? Um, I, I can't speak for other caregivers. Um, I, I would say that my anxiety over the situation has been up and down for, gosh, over seven years now. Um, obviously, initially, it was just both anxiety and depression, which I have, a, I do have a history of postpartum depression and anxiety. So I wasn't surprised. And, and like I mentioned, we had just moved. Um, so that initial um, just shock, and, and yes, it is, it is traumatic. It's traumatic telling your five and 10 year old that your dad has cancer. And you know, initially we had no idea, you know, what was going to happen with him. We didn't quite understand like the long-term ramifications of CLL. Um, and so I think, you know, there's that initial spike and, and like you mentioned, um, you know, there, there was a part of me when he started, when he finally started treatment, um, I was like, okay, we're, he's getting help. This is going to be a good thing. But then it also felt like it, because it's a chronic cancer, we know there's not a cure at this point. Like it, it almost starts the clock <laughs> of 
sometime he'll relapse. I mean, and, and, you know, part of that is the, like, I have anxiety issues. So um, I, I tend to think like catastrophically when you should, you know, try to focus more on like what's going on in the present tense and, um, and stuff like that. But yeah, the anxiety and depression has just gone up and down, um, you know, and depending on we've moved again since then and, you know, getting out of your routine, it can be, that can spike, uh, you know, depression and anxiety too. And it does for me a little bit. So um, yes, I absolutely identify with everything you were saying, Allison. It's gonna, there's one commonality and I appreciate that you can't speak for any other caregiver, nor can I speak for anyone else's personal experience, except for the fact that there's one commonality we all as caregivers share. And that is the challenge of sitting with uncertainty. That is your task, right? Not knowing what the next year or month or in some cases week or even day could bring. And that that is really difficult and absolutely drives anxiety. Absolutely. Are there times when that uncertainty is more prevalent or profound than others for you, Lisa or Allison, in your work with caregivers, either one of you? Um, well, certainly we, we see a spike in scanxiety, um, you know, coming up on routine scans and, and up, you know, close to these evaluations. But I think that overall it, it ebbs and flows according to many different factors. You know, it could be as simple as witnessing a certain symptom in your loved one that mimic the symptom that they had when they were first diagnosed with cancer, or it could be you know, not having heard from the doctor. There's a lot of triggers for that. So I, I there's there's no one pattern though. The, the only piece being around scan time is obviously a time of high anxiety. You know what, do you know what triggers from, is a trigger for me on anxiety and, you know, about cancer is um, over the years, there are, this sounds, I know that's how this sounds, but you hear about celebrities dying and they'll, they'll just say leukemia and it, it makes my heart stop. I still remember the first time I heard of a, like after Nathan had been diagnosed, I was driving to work and I was listening to the radio and they were talking about some celebrity had died of leukemia. And I still, I don't remember who the celebrity was, um, but I remember the feeling I had. And I, when I got to work, I immediately like Googled what, you know, leukemia this person had to make, to make sure it wasn't Nathan's. Um, because, you know, at, at that point we knew it was chronic. Um, we had, we saw three different doctors before he settled on his specialist. Um, and you know, he, we knew at that point it wasn't, he wasn't going to die, you know, right away that this is a manageable disease. Um, but for me, it, uh, it causes a spike when I hear about people dying of specifically leukemia. I mean, it's, it's all tragic. Um, but when they say leukemia, I'm always like, what kind? Um, so I'm just curious from both of you, is there anything that we can say to a caregiver um, or things that aren't helpful? So th those of us around you that want to support and love on you as well, what should and should we say? Do you want, you, do you want to I'll let you go first for this, Lisa. Um, okay, so I think that... A, here's what I'll say. You have to give people grace. Um, they want to say something that is comforting and what they think is comforting may not be comforting to that person. Um, so what I really hated hearing was you have to be strong for Nathan. And I know it's true. You do. Um, but I, I need someone to vent to as well. Like I was only 35. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting to be a single mom. I wasn't expecting like my husband to, to die that young or something, you know? So it was just, I, for me, like you have to be strong. It's, it's uh, it still just doesn't sit right with me. Um, but I think like just expressing your concern for a caregiver, telling them if you need something, call me. Um, you know, if, if they're a close friend or family, like, I love you, please call. I'm here for you to vent. Um, you know, and then specific tasks, if, if it's like a really stressful time, you know, can you bring dinner um, one night or take the kids one night so that the caregiver and the patient have just some time to relax? Like those kinds of actionable things 
um, are going to go a long way. And just like I said, just being there for the, for the caregiver to vent um, is is huge. Yeah, I mean, I have to agree. Uh, I think that one of the most powerful things that we can say to a caregiver is, how can I help you today? I think that it's really important to know that support isn't one size fits all, right? We're all unique as humans and what we need in specific circumstances is unique. But the best thing, the most effective thing to do is to ask specifically, what can I do for you today? And maybe there's nothing, but maybe it is, oh, you know what? You could actually do some grocery shopping for me or I've been trying to get the pharmacy to call me back. Is there any chance you can call them for me? Anything concrete and specific and measurable is always really helpful. Every caregiver listening and tuning in knows that there are a million things on your list that you need to do and there's just no time. And I wanna encourage everyone that next time someone does offer support, challenge yourself to say, yes, actually there are three things that I could use your help with and here they are. Um, I think that we as caregivers, don't always do that. Um, but really the best thing for you to do if you're supporting someone who's a caregiver is to say, what specifically can I help you with today, this week, this month? You know, I think in terms of things to not say, I actually find, and, and I come to this both as a professional working in caregiving science and also as someone who has had a experience as a family caregiver for, for quite some time, that I find that oxygen mask metaphor incredibly invalidating. So being told to put on your oxygen mask when there literally is no opportunity to put on an oxygen mask makes caregivers feel terrible. And I think similarly, you know, it's, it's almost putting extra responsibility. Every caregiver knows they need to take care of themselves, right? And I'm the one who started this by saying, it's November, you should take care of yourself. I know you know that. But telling someone in the moment when they're incredibly distressed, it actually makes things worse. And so better yet is to say, I know this is a really hard time. When you are able to take a breath, let me know and let me know how I can help. That's way more effective. I love that. And I love how you said, what can I do for you today? Because like there are good days for caregivers and there are bad days for caregivers. There were a lot of bad days initially. Um, and I had just started a new job. I was, it was just, like I said, we had moved our family. We were completely out of the routine. There were still boxes in our house that were unpacked or packed. Um, it was just, so what can I do for you today? I, I love that part. It's, it's just, it's, it's going to be different. One day you're going to be fine. And the next you are going to be a mess. Are there any positive benefits for being a caregiver? Lisa, I'll start with you and then Allison. Um, you know, this is a hard question for me. Because ultimately, I think um, every experience that I have had as a human has made me who I am today. And I think when we are when we are given challenges, that is an opportunity for us to grow as a person, um, grow in our you know compassion and understanding and knowledge. And so, I I truly do appreciate um, that this has made me the person I am today. I am very passionate about people being able to get medical care and and there not be um you know such a financial struggle it like it's it just has really changed my views on insurance and health care and what that means um so i think there are positives but i still struggle with calling it like i i just struggle with the idea of what positives are there because your husband had cancer <laughs> you know it's it's a hard there are, um, but it, it's hard to see those initially. Yeah, so I think part of what you're you're touching on is this idea of not wanting to get into like the power of positive thinking or turning lemons to lemonade and the idea that we just want to switch it around and say, we're going to make something good out of this awful thing that's happened. And that's, I think that's unrealistic. And quite frankly, it's unhealthy and damaging. I strongly believe that we all as humans have the ability to experience both suffering and meaning. And in that lens, through that lens, the caregiving experience is one that can very much engender an enhanced sense of meaning and purpose in one's life generally and caregiving specifically. Um, time and again, I hear caregivers say to me that they learn new things about themselves. One, one woman shared with me that she was someone who was really shy but going through the experience of having to advocate for her husband, she found her voice by having to speak with all the medical professionals and she became an incredibly outspoken advocate for him. 
another adult child who had a very strained relationship with a parent found that while she was very begrudgingly serving as a caregiver, it gave her an opportunity to try to repair a relationship with her mother. Um, and, and even though it wasn't fully repaired after her mom died, she was able to look back and say, at least I tried. And that was huge. I think there's many opportunities for meaning, for purpose, for growth. And I think that all of us who go through this, we emerge a different version of ourselves because of the fact that we, we do gain strength. I, we'd all probably give it back in a second, but we do emerge stronger, likely, likely stronger versions of ourselves, more outspoken, more savvy in, in terms of everything. We all emerge with MDs and PhDs and social work degrees and JDs. And we're also, you know, we all know how to navigate the whole system because you have to as a caregiver. And that too actually serves us all quite well as we move forward from the period of active caregiving. Allison, can you tell us a little bit more about, about when you said making meaning and meaning making? You know, what is that? How do we do that as a supportive intervention or supportive care for caregivers? How does, can you tell us a little bit more about that? So, this is a pointed question because a lot of my research has actually focused on how we can as family caregivers connect to a sense of meaning and purpose in life. And it's not something that happens overnight. And I would say, and I'll reflect on what Lisa shared, it's, it's also not something that I think happens for individuals who are newly in the role. And I think the fact that I have, my, my dad passed in 2019, it's been a few years since I was an active caregiver, that I can look back now and really connect. It's something that, that, is, a, that is a process over time. But I think that we can think through the experience of caregiving from different lenses of meaning. For example, um, it's part of who we are. It becomes a part of our identity and our sense of self. And there could be great strength in that. We can make meaning by reflecting on, for example, the fact that no one has a choice to become a caregiver, but how we choose to face the caregiving role, well, that can engender an incredible sense of pride. Um, for Lisa, for you to look back and think about how you navigated at 35 years old, your husband at 44 with young kids, you moved across the country, what incredible strength you had to go through that and choose to face it the way that you did. You know, to think through the ways in which, despite the limitations we face as caregivers, that, that there are opportunities to continue to create your life. You know, maybe it, you can't take the job across the country, or maybe you can't take that trip you wanted to take, or maybe you're putting other dreams on hold, but there are other elements of your life that are actually getting cultivated because of your caregiving role, and that itself can be an incredible source of meaning. And then I think very basically, Caregiving really puts us in touch with the value of experiencing life through our five senses, through the power of touch, through a tight handhold or hug, through listening to your favorite music with your loved one, through connecting through visions of beauty, that these moments, these mindful moments actually take on such incredible meaning when the, pos the threat of illness comes in. I mean, it's meaningful for all of us, but when the threat of illness is there, it becomes even more special. So I think that there's these, these sources of meaning that we all can draw on that I think for caregivers can become incredibly powerful resources. And it's really you know, not about saying you're not gonna be burdened, you're not gonna be anxious. Yeah, you're gonna be burdened and anxious, but you could also feel incredibly connected to your loved one and feel you know, incredibly proud of yourself. I, I agree. I I would say, you know, Nathan and I are very fortunate in that um, we have grown together through this. I think, you know, I think challenges like this um, can be really tough on a marriage and on a family. Um, Nathan and I, I, our biggest challenge before this one, uh, we deployed five times while he was active duty um, since we've been together. And so I thought, you know, like him leaving when our youngest was a year old and I had two kids by myself, um, I thought that was our biggest challenge. Um, but, you know, it, it we have grown closer. And, and one other thing I'll say that I found both frustrating and wonderful is that because our kids were on the younger side, five and 10, um, while my 10 year old was much more traumatized by her dad having cancer. She understood it certainly much more than my five-year-old at the time. Um, but they're still kids. And as much as they love their dad, their world kind of like at that age, it revolves around them. So it forced us not to always dwell on cancer, cancer, cancer. 
because our kids still wanted to go play soccer and go to the playground and they wanted to do all those things. And we had to kind of step outside of this bubble of sadness and anxiety um, and researching treatments. That's what my husband did um, for most of the summer after he was diagnosed. Um, I, I do appreciate that my kids were self-centered enough that they pulled us out of that. And, and we remembered that there's normal parts of life too that, that still go on. I also, I just want to respond. I appreciate so much your sharing the value of, of, of where your kids were developmentally and, and, and how they did pull you back. They pulled you into the present moment to be mindful. Yes. I want to just qualify what, you know, what I shared before and just reflect on Lisa that this, this idea of making meaning or finding benefit, you know, feeling a sense of purpose, it doesn't, it's not contingent on having the type of relationship that Lisa, you have with your husband. You don't have to have a warm and even loving relationship with your care partner to make benefit in the caregiving role. There are many caregivers who are have no choice but to take care of individuals who have, you know, with whom they've had incredibly strained relationships, even folks who in the past may have been abusive to them emotionally or verbally, but they are thrust into the caregiving role. And I want to acknowledge that reality for many caregivers, but nonetheless, that opportunity is still there. It doesn't, it's not contingent on having a loving relationship with a patient. Yeah, I'm curious, ladies, we've been talking a lot about self-care and, and where you find support and how to talk and, and relate. And I'm wondering, how, do, how does someone know when it's time to seek out professional help or whether that be a therapist, a counselor, a support group? How do you know, okay, I think this is, I, I need some extra help with this. I'm happy to start. I mean, the most obvious to me as a mental health professional is if you're having thoughts that life isn't worth living, that this is just too overwhelming, that those are those are the big red flags, it's time for support. Um, and it makes sense to have those types of thoughts when life is overwhelming, but it's a sign that, that help is really needed. If you feel like you're drowning, if you feel like you can't get through the day to day, if, if you feel like the emotional weight of caregiving is preventing you from actually taking care of your loved one and, and carrying out your responsibilities for them. That's a sign it's time. And also if you're not able to take care of yourself, if you've really neglected yourself completely, then it's a sign that it's time to really seek help. I wanna just normalize and say that, you know, I started the caregivers clinic, not because caregivers are psychiatrically ill. I started the clinic because caregiving is terribly difficult. It is one of the most difficult roles we as humans could take on. And so it's normal to have anxiety, depression, and trauma. This is all normal. And when you feel it, if it's intense, getting support is absolutely the best thing that you can do for yourself and for the loved one that you're taking care of. I think um, for me, my, my realization, I, I knew, I knew throughout, he was diagnosed right after Memorial Day weekend in 2016. And I knew throughout the summer that my anxiety was getting to be unmanageable. I like, I just have a very specific, like, like thing that happens when I, my anxiety is getting out of control and it has to do with driving it, which has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> um, I haven't even been in a car accident, none of that, but I, and I, I was driving to work every day. So it's not like I couldn't drive. Um, and so that started happening a lot. I was really struggling to be able to drive. And I also knew when it was to the point where I did not want to get out of bed. And that's not who I am. Um, you know, like everybody loves to like hang out on the weekend sometime in bed and read a book or whatever. But every day I just had to force myself to get up and go to work. And I just wanted to lay in bed and pull the covers over my head. And so by like August, so it, we, he was diagnosed at the end of May. By August, these things were like very loudly, um, like ringing, you know, like this is, this is not manageable. Um, and that's when I sought counseling um, because I just, I knew that I could not go on with this high level of anxiety um, every day. I, I knew I needed to be the best and the healthiest I could be so that I could be there for my kids and my husband and, and my work. Um, so, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Lisa. And, and you know, I appreciate your, your being vulnerable and, and sharing all of this. And, and one thing you said in there that I think is so important is you said, this was not like me. This was not who I was to, you know, to not get out of bed. And I think that 
when, if you feel you, like you've become disconnected from who you are authentically, if you're someone who historically has always wanted to get out of bed or you're, you've always done X, Y, Z and you just can't get yourself to do it, that's a sign that it's time for some support. Do you find, Lisa, that some of the support you got were, didn't necessarily have to come from a therapist or a social worker or a counselor um, or support? Was it, was it just sometimes people around you or where, where did you seek support or, or seek out someone to talk to in general if it, if it wasn't a, a professional? Um, I am very fortunate that I have, um, I do have close friends and um, I'm very, I'm close with my mother. And so I was able to like vent to them. But um, for me, I, I needed somebody outside of my world who was objective and could see things for what they are and weren't necessarily like sympathetic to anything that I'm telling them, you know, like they're not as affected by I needed a counselor who wasn't going to be affected by the fact that Nathan had cancer. Like you can, you know, it's it's a very like, like they're not associated with him. So it's 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 just a bit removed. And I needed somebody to help me focus on myself and get through my like learn techniques to deal with the anxiety and depression. Um and so that's ultimately what I chose is a counselor who you know, didn't know Nathan, didn't, you know, know anybody in my family and could just talk to me um, about my experience. Allison, is it hard for people to access counselor or therapy today, whether cost or availability? Is it hard for people to find that? I think that in, sometimes it can feel like climbing Mount Everest to get, to get psychosocial support. But I also think that there are some specific things that you can do to find support. And, you know, if you're, if your loved one is receiving care at a cancer center, a great place to start is to talk to a social worker um, who's associated with the medical team or even a nurse to say who, who's in charge of psychosocial care. You know, the type of program that we have at Sloan Kettering, it's not common though. Part of my, my mission right now is to make sure that we can start to replicate these types of clinics so that all cancer centers can have mental health programs specifically for, for caregivers. But until that time, most cancer centers do have social workers who are providing support either individually or in groups or who are great resources to let you know where to go in the community. You know, and towards that end, there are phenomenal community-based organizations that are providing support. There's a lot of toll-free hotlines out there. So through the cancer support community, the CLL Society, through LLS and other organizations, there's a lot of actual support available. So it's just a matter of, do you know where to look for it? And do you recommend reaching out to some of these organizations? Absolutely. I mean, I, I always think having support is a good thing. And I think part of what Lisa touched on is the value of having someone who's not in your family, not in your specific caregiver orbit to whom you can share openly without judgment is so very valuable. Um, and I think because it can take a little bit of time or months possibly to get in with a provider, whoever, a therapist or social worker or whoever it is, it's, it's good to start the process soon and early. I was, I was just going to say that where we lived, um, there was not a local enough um, support group. It was, uh, you know, 45 minutes to an hour away. Um, I mean, there was like the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society that you just mentioned. They, they do have a support group um, where we, near where we lived. It was, you know, up in Louisville um, and we lived about 45 minutes away. So it just, um, for me, that wasn't like close enough to participate in that. But certainly um, I think there's value in finding what works for you. So if that's joining a support group so that you are around other people and know that you're not alone, um, if it's finding a one-on-one -on -one counselor, which is what which was what I preferred to do and what I did, um, who can kind of give you a broader perspective too and help work on specific things um, that are triggering your anxiety or depression or, or, or whatever. Um, yeah, I finding all the different ways and learning all the different ways, whether that's, you know, through the cancer center where you are, um, those can all be valuable and um, meaningful for caregivers. And one silver, there's one silver lining of the pandemic, I think, for, for caregivers, and that is telehealth. And, and the fact is that while, you know, there may not be someone local for you, Lisa, you had to drive 45 minutes to Louisville to get that care. The fact is that we now actually can provide, we know we can provide high quality care over these screens. Um, and I, I think that it's important just to consider it's just as effective to do that. 
I agree. Um, I mean, I, I still see a counselor and I mean, I have an appointment tomorrow and it's via telehealth and, uh, you know, it's a great way to not have to be in person with someone, but still get the care you need. Allison, do you have suggestions on how people can find out how to access somebody for telehealth? Is that through their insurance? Is that through their doctor? I'm just curious how people might look, look into that. Well, I think, again, um, speaking with the social worker at the cancer center where your loved one receives care, they'll probably have some information about um, opportunities to receive care over telehealth platforms. And I think most cancer centers across the country have been using these platforms. Um, I also think another way to go about it actually is through your insurance and, and to see who's covered um, under your insurance plan and do they do sessions via telehealth. And the other is the psychologist, the website psychologytoday.com, which is a great resource to find a therapist across the country. And you can see whether they see patients in person or via telehealth and what insurance they take. And as Lisa shared, it, it is also available for caregivers. It's not just the person with cancer that can see counseling or support help. Is that is that what I hear you both saying as well? 100%. We have a, a question in the comment and chat, and it's an important one uh, that I want to make sure we leave a, a few minutes to discuss. Um, first of all, it says, Lisa and Allison, thank you so much for this great seminar. I couldn't agree with you more about your sentiments about learning things very quickly. I'm curious to know your point of view on utilizing hospice care in the cancer journey. How to decide when is the right time? I was surprised to learn hospice does not provide support 24-7. And we never really actually utilized it during my father's journey as we didn't want to discontinue treatment. What should we do today to prepare ourselves and the loved ones we have for long-term care needs? Well, for whoever asked this, thank you. This is an incredibly important question and there's no one answer to this. So first of all, you're highlighting one of the major limitations of hospice care, which is hospice care doesn't provide 24 seven care. And I just wanna make sure, because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding out there between what is meant by palliative care and hospice care. So I'm gonna take this moment as a teaching opportunity. Palliative care is any care that's delivered to address symptoms. Um, from pain to issues with sleep. And, um, and just FYI, support for caregivers actually falls into the category of palliative care. It's symptom management, it's quality of life, it's improving quality of life, promoting quality of life. And by the way, it can be implemented at any point in an illness trajectory from the point of a patient's diagnosis through end of life. That's palliative care. That's different from what, what um, this participant had mentioned is hospice care, which is care that's focused explicitly on promoting quality of life at the end of life. Um, and it's usually prescribed by a physician at a point when they can say that this patient has likely six months or less to live. Um, and hospice care is a set of services that involve um, a medical team and a nursing team that come in. But as this participant noted, I think there's some misunderstanding sometimes that the hospice team is gonna come in and they're gonna provide also you know, home health aids and. 24 hour care, and that's not the case. Also, hospice care can be deliver delivered in an inpatient hospice setting or at home. And that, by the way, is a very important decision for families where they want hospice care to occur if there is a choice over that. Um, the question there of when is the right time, that answer is very specific to each family and to each patient. And that could depend on what are the patient's goals of care in terms of how long they want to receive active curative care, for example, um, to what do they need hospice care? Are, this, are the services that are available for hospice even necessary at a certain point? For many families, the choice to implement hospice care doesn't come until the last weeks or even days of life because what is really needed is that medical support towards the end of life. And so it's a very specific, it's very specific to each family. And so my answer, which I hope doesn't feel like I'm avoiding the question is that I cannot emphasize enough the value of open, honest, vulnerable, and keyword repeated conversations about goals of care. That's conversations that you as caregivers have with your, your loved ones, your family members. And by the way, these don't even have to happen if they're patients themselves. It can happen with someone who's not medically ill, but just thinking about what their goals are for the future. But these conversations need to happen repeatedly and, and specifically if there are changes in treatments over time. And that will help you to understand when is the right time to implement hospice care. I'm gonna stop there. I just think I went in a whole circle. <laughs> no, you were it was beautiful. So thank you. 
And I appreciate that you said repeatedly, because I think sometimes think, okay, I had that discussion, I'm done. And we don't ever have to talk about this again. I often hear people say, you know, that change. I don't know, Lisa, is, have you ever had to have some of these tough discussions with Nathan? I'm sorry, had to have what kind of? What? Have you ever had to have some of these discussions about, you know, what happens in the future? Is this something you've ever had to go through with Nathan? Yeah, so um, not as immediate, just because his cancer is chronic. So, um, but we have definitely talked about how our goals for our lives, what we expected have changed. Um, you know, one of our retirement goals was always to full-time RV for a couple of years. We've had an RV for uh, years now, like 10 years. We love camping with the kids and um, without the kids too. Um, and so we always knew that when our youngest goes off to college, we plan to pull up the stakes and head out for a couple of years and see the country. Um, and I think, you know, Nathan's almost 10 years older than me. So we knew it would be like, it would likely need to happen before, like I was really retirement age. Um, but we kind of, we, we reassessed like when we really expect to do this, because we don't know what the long-term, we, we don't know long-term what's going to happen with his health. Um, we know that there's lots of research and science and the prognosis is really wonderful that he will live a normal lifespan. And, and that is how we feel. We, we feel optimistic about that. Um, but, you know, things happen. So we know that we want to, we want to go full-time RV for a couple of years sooner than we initially planned. Um, so we just, we try to think in those kinds of terms, like plan for, what is it? Hope for the best, plan for the worst. Um, you know, we just, I think that's right. Um, yep. but it's, it's really important for us that we, we just had to reassess the timeline of what, what our lives, you know, what we thought our lives would be. What I love so much about that, there's many things I love about that, Lisa, especially the image that I have of, of you guys going around the country right now. But, you know, I think what's so powerful about that is the idea that when we engage in goals of care conversations, they cannot be disentangled from goals of life conversations. And so when you are speaking with your loved ones about what's important to them in terms of the type of care they might receive in the future, at the same time, it's the perfect opportunity to talk about, well, what's important for us to do right now? How can we maximize the time we have right now? Well, and Lisa, you mentioned your children and your family. And so Nathan's not the only person you're caregiving for. Um, obviously, you've got your children. How do you balance caregiving for your whole family as well as you're working and, and navigating insurance and healthcare systems. And how do you balance all that as a caregiver? Um, well, I mentioned I'm still in therapy. So, <laughs> um, I, you know, I think you can have a lot of things, but you can't have it all at once. And you certainly can't have balance all at once. I, I do feel very fortunate. Nathan, um, he, he only works part-time. So I work full-time from home, but you know, we are both very invested in all the things that it takes to run a household and take care of kids and parents and, and all of those things. Um, I, it's really about communication, honestly, just, you know, I mean, there, there are just days where I'm like, you know what, Nathan, I cannot handle getting Anna to volleyball practice. Like I need you to do this. And so it's just knowing that you can be open and honest and communicate um, in, a, in a way that isn't offensive. You know, you don't get angry about it. Um, I mean, we've done all those things over the years. Like I just get fed up because I feel like I have to do it all. And then Nathan's like, okay, I can do this, Lisa. You know, so um, I think that's really, it's communication is so important. And knowing yourself and recognizing when you are getting to the point where you can't balance it all and doing whatever it is you need, whether it's counseling, whether it's getting a massage or, you know, sitting in like closing the bedroom door and saying, you know what, you guys leave me alone today and reading a book, if that's what you like to do. Um, I, I, I think all of those things are really important just to recognize for yourself it's not always going to be balanced. And, you know, now my kids are 18 and almost 13. 
And I just, I don't think there's any balance to having teenagers. <laughs> I'm an 18 year old myself. I can relate to that part at least. So yes, I agree. Allison, any thoughts on that? And the, the caregiver, you know, just sort of managing, juggling everything sometimes? Oh my gosh. I mean, caregiving never happens in isolation right? It's never, I'm just going to <clears throat> take care of this person. I'm going to take care of this person and also take care of these other people. And I'm also going to work a full-time paid job, hopefully, maybe, and all these other things that, that, that have to be done. I think one thing that, that Lisa said so powerfully is that not everything can be happening or the, so, something to the lines of, we can't do everything all the time. And I think it's understanding that, I was just talking to, to a patient about this earlier this week, that that maybe for a certain period in your life, your career was the thing and you identified as the career person. And now because you are overwhelmed with caregiving, you're still working, but you're, you're sort of keeping your head down and that's okay. You can't necessarily wor work full throttle while you're also full-time caregiving. And I think it's really giving ourselves to use the language of grace that you used earlier, Lisa, to give yourself the grace to understand that we are human. We only have so much bandwidth to do so much and to prioritize where does your energy need to go? And knowing that maybe there'll be a time in the future when once again, yes, you can focus more on career or you can focus more on your hobbies, or maybe you can't focus more on your kids. And right now you can't because you're taking care of your mom and your mom needs your help. Right. And, and those are, those are important choices um, that need to be made, but, but to really give yourself permission to not do everything 100%. And, you know, perfect is the enemy of good enough. Like, you know, it's just, my house is never as clean as I want it to be, but in the grand scheme of things, like, you know, there's just, there's just more important things. And, you know, whether it's family or a task at work or, or any of those things or going to an appointment with Nathan, um, you know, we're fortunate that at this point he goes every six months, he's been in remission for almost six years. Um, you know, it's just, it, it's, it's all about doing what you can when you can. You know, we have a question and which actually dovetails perfectly into that. Uh, Jim is asking, is there one attribute or superpower that caregivers have in themselves when they're pushed to their limits? I mean, I personally think every caregiver is a superhuman, super, you know, just incredible. I think the superpower is that somehow in those moments, when you are pushed to your limit, you find that extra ounce to keep going. And maybe that's because of your connection with the patient, because of your love for them. Maybe it's because of a value that was instilled in, in you as a young person that you're carrying forward, a commitment to care. Um, or maybe you can't identify why, but there's something in you that keeps you going. That's a superpower. I, I agree. Finding when you think you have been as strong as you can, like I have, I have found many times over the last seven and a half years that um, you are definitely stronger than you think, uh, you know, and it's just it, not every day, though. I mean, there are days where certainly I was like, I am out. Just leave me alone. Um, but there are you are stronger than you realize especially if you take time to take care of yourself, you will find that strength um, if you're taking care of yourself first. I think something that's so important to acknowledge right in this moment is that to be strong doesn't mean you're not emotional. I think there's <laughs> really this misunderstanding that I hear a lot in my clinic that, well, if I cry, if I allow myself to fall apart, then I'm not strong. My response is always, no, 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 no. It's the other way around. If you are doing everything you can to avoid emotions, well, that's actually not strong. What strength is, is giving yourself permission to express fully the range of what you feel, the sadness, the anger, be angry. This is difficult, all the, all the things, and to let that out. And then that's going to help you find the strength to keep going. And, and look, I grew up in an Italian house and we feel all the emotions. We express all the emotions. Okay. And so... <laughs> Um, those definitely came out over, <laughs> you know, that first summer. Um, it was it was all of the emotions and just there is so much anger because I was like, you know what, this is this is not fair. I mean, as if anything in life is fair, but this is not fair. My my kids deserve to have their dad and you know for their dad not to have cancer and 
all of these things. So um, yes, feeling all those emotions and crying and like angry crying is, you know, it's, it's healing. It is, it makes you feel better. We're almost at the end of our time and I'm just curious, uh, is there one thing uh, that you haven't got to say yet, either of you that you wanna make sure that this audience of, of caregivers and people who love caregivers can see anything you wanna share that we haven't got to? You know, I think one of the things that comes up often in the clinic and for, for so many of the caregivers that I've worked with professionally is the challenges that we face as caregivers in our country and the fact that we have, we don't, for example, have a robust paid family medical leave policy that too many caregivers are having to choose between paid employment and caregiving that, you know, let me say it, I'm going to say it, caregivers are the long-term care system in this country. Our healthcare system depends on caregivers and that's real. Um, but I think I also want to acknowledge that I am feeling like we're at a precipice of change where we are starting to see some national policies that I think will, in the coming near future, have some very potential benefits for all of us as caregivers. So, for example, we have currently passed in 45 states and territories what's called the CARE Act. Caregiver, it stands for Caregiver Advise, Record, Enable Act. And basically it says hospitals need to do three things. It needs to record the name and contact information of caregivers in the records of patients. It needs to let caregivers know when patients are transferred or discharged from the hospital, which seems obvious. And I think most importantly is it requires hospitals to provide caregivers with training and support so they know how to take care of their loved one when their loved one goes home. And I think that this is a type of policy and, and that's, that's moving us toward recognizing that caregivers are key members of the treatment team. They need to be treated as such and supported as such. But I, I do feel cautiously optimistic that we're gonna see more of this in the coming years. I think if there's one thing that I would tell my, my 2016 self when we found out um, that Nathan had cancer is don't feel guilty for taking care of yourself. It's it's you need to take care of yourself. You cannot, I hate to like speak in like cliche like terms, but you cannot fill up anybody else's cup if yours is empty. So you have to take care of yourself and do not feel guilty about that. I mean, it, it is just, I felt like awful whenever I had to do something that, and I couldn't, if I couldn't go to like every single appointment with Nathan or something like that, it was just, um, don't feel guilty for taking care of yourself. You deserve self-care, you deserve help um, and in meaningful ways. Um, so that's what I would say. Beautifully said, thank you. Well, as we start to come to a close here, I just wanna thank both of our special guests today um, and all of you in our audience for taking part in our informative discussion um, the message is very clear, I think, that we must better integrate identifying and addressing the distress the caregivers experience. And we've got to integrate this into quality medical and cancer care. Uh, mental health and mental health care for patients and caregivers are crucial. Um, and we have to take notice. And that's why we, we brought you together today. Um, so on behalf of our team here at Beijing, we thank you all for joining our Talk About It program. We encourage you to visit cancerandmentalhealth.com for more information and resources, and please share it with others and share how important it is to support caregivers and let them know that they are not alone in this journey either. Thank you so much and happy National Family Caregiver Month.